Good evening. I'm Joe Nye, Dean of the Kennedy School, and it's my pleasure to welcome tonight Secretary of Agriculture Dan Glickman. Secretary Glickman has a distinguished career as a public servant. He was elected to the House in 1976 to represent Kansas' 4th Congressional District, and we just learned a minute ago that uh, his district abutted that of Mickey Edwards, who is teaching here at the school. When he joined the Clinton Cabinet, in March of 1995, he brought with him nearly two decades of experience in the House of Representatives, both on the Agriculture Committee, but also as chairman of the House Permanent Select Intelligence Committee. In addition to his work on key farm bills, he was the leading congressional advocate for improving food safety and expanding agricultural trade. He took steps to reorganize the Department of Agriculture and part of the Reinventing Government and National Performance Review, and under his leadership by 1999, he will have cut the department's agencies by nearly a third and reduced its staff by 13,000, saving $4 billion as part of that reorganization. His record has involved more than institutional streamlining. His department has greatly improved food safety standards through a sweeping overhaul of meat and poultry inspection, and he has also done a great deal to improve farm income and employment. And under his leadership, the USDA has helped pioneer the use of new technologies to boost the economies of rural communities. Please help welcome Secretary of Agriculture Dan Glickman. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. A little secret, I applied to Harvard as a senior in South, from Southeast High School in Wichita, I got rejected. So I finally made it here. I'm, we make mistakes. Okay. Uh, I thank you very much. I'm delighted uh, to see my friend Mickey Edwards, who ca I came to the Congress the same year. Uh, we were classmates along with uh, Vice President Al Gore, uh, House uh, Minority Leader Dick Gephardt, Senator, I mean Vice President Dan Quayle, and a few other people who've gone to the federal penitentiary. So <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, it's a mixed group, I guess to say. But I, I'm really delighted to be here. And I have to tell you that uh, it's an interesting thing. I'm, I'm the secretary of the department that probably touches your life on a day-to-day -day basis more than any other department of government. Because largely I have to do with the food you eat and whether it is there and it's safe and it's nutritious and it's available. And uh, every, uh, the, uh, recently there was a, one of the folks who works for me in the department was out in front of USDA. And if you've been on the mall, the USDA is the only federal agency right on the mall, and the tourmobile drives by every 15 minutes. It's where you get your, your, you know, all the information about Washington. And as it stopped in front of the Department of Agriculture, it said, here on your right is the Department of Agriculture, where they have more employees than there are farmers in the United States. And that really started me thinking, I mean, what, what is it that we do and how do we express this? And so it's one of the reasons I'm sure that you probably haven't had very many of my predecessors here at Harvard University in the past. I'm sure you've had people in foreign policy and defense policy and, and those kinds of issues. And I know my colleague uh, Bill Daly was here yesterday and he talked to me a little bit about it. But, you know, Abraham Lincoln created the Department of Agriculture in 1862 as the People's Department. It was the department to serve people's prime needs, and at that time, agriculture was the prime industry in America, and it was called the People's Department. But, uh, and production agriculture is still the heart, politically, of what we do. The agriculture committees in Congress are largely based on rural people interested in production agriculture. And we do a fine job in America because we have uh, the safest and price-wise cheapest food in the world. And we, we do so in great bounties and we produce about twice as much as we consume. We've never had to fight a war for a shortage of food. It's a pretty good opportunity. It's actually the strongest, largest single industry in America is the food production industry. But it's not the most glamorous industry. And I tell you a couple stories. Recently I was at, uh, being Secretary of Agriculture, doesn't get all the massive attention. I was at the vice president's daughter's wedding. And uh, I came out of the wedding with my wife. And we got into a car. And one of the photographers, there were dozens of them there, uh, knocked on the window. I uh, came out and he said, how was the wedding? I said, fine. Said, how did the vice president look? How did Mrs. Gore look? Did you talk about politics? What kind of politicians were there? And he wouldn't leave me alone. True story. I said, thank you. And he said, thank you. I got in my car. And then he rushed up in a wild rush, 
like he had forgotten something. And he knocked on the window of the car, and I rolled down the window. I said, what is it? He says, by the way, who are you? <laughs> and it was kind of the classic thing, you know, in terms of what I do and what our, our department does. And it's a little bit different in the international arena, where food and agriculture are, and are big issues, particularly in the environmental side of the picture. In 1996, I led the US delegation to the World Food Summit in Rome. And I gave a big speech on food and biotechnology and producing food using less pesticides and less herbicides and less insecticides and less water. And I thought I did a good job until Another true story, a bunch of protesters stood up, started pelting me with soybeans, and it, that wouldn't have been all that bad. There were about 500 people in the room, but then they took off all their clothes and they had a nude news conference right in front of me in a room like this. And, and they had things written on their bodies like the naked truth and no gene beans. At least that's what my staff who looked told me that they had on there. Now, between these extremes of anonymity and overexposure <laughs> lies the bulk of what I do. And beyond production agriculture, I manage America's national forests. The Forest Service is in the Department of Agriculture. It's the largest land management agency in government. So Smokey Bear and his 39,800 co-workers work for me in USDA. And that's the largest part of the Department of Agriculture. I put the USDA inspection seal on meat and poultry you buy at the grocery store. And generally, we are referred to at USDA as the Food Safety Agency. I run the food stamp program, which is the last remaining federal entitlement program after welfare reform, and er basically an urban program that serves about 25 million Americans every day, but has a lot of rural uh, folks who need it. I also am responsible for the school lunch program, which we serve between a third and a half of the food that's served in 100,000 schools every single day in this country, the WIC program, the commodity programs. And uh, so this is a great big department in addition to all the other rural pr programs that we do to try to make sure that rural America has the same kind of break that urban America does in housing and sewer and water systems and other kinds of things. But I have another perspective which I wanted to really talk a little more about and that is, is that having been in the Congress for 18 years and now a Secretary of Agriculture, I, I can see the government from two-thirds of what the Founding Fathers had in mind. And it gives me a little bit of a perspective on terms of this system that we operate in. The first political seat I ever ran for was the school board, where I, I was a member and president of the Wichita, Kansas School Board. Then I went on to unseat a 16-year member of Congress, a Republican member of the House. I spent a total of about $95,000 in 1976 running in a contested primary and a contested general. You'd be lucky to spend, uh, uh, you'd spend about 10 times that amount today. And then 18 years later in the Republican sweep of 1994, I got my own walking papers, okay? And I think it was actually more of a surprise when I won, however than when I lost. I was the first Democrat to hold the seat for 40 years in Wichita, Kansas. And over time, the district grew more conservative. But as long as Reagan and Bush were in the White House, folks seemed fine with me in Congress. And there was a balance there. Then along came a Democratic president. Then there was the budget vote in 1993 that I supported. Then I supported the assault weapons ban. And I supported a woman's right to choose, all of which ticked off a vocal active minority in my district. And I guess I, if I had been a little more parochial about those issues, maybe I could have held on, but, but I voted what, the way I think was right. So do most people in the House. I paid the price with no regrets. And in Congress, you are one of 435. So the pressure is really on to stand out, which you can do eventually through seniority or quickly through flamboyance. When I first came in, just like everyone else, I wanted to make a point that I was different. So the first issue I took up was eliminating elevator operators on automatic elevators in the Capitol. I was the first person to take that issue up. Why were we paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for these people? Couldn't we afford to push our own buttons? I fought and fought, and my colleagues around me got angrier and angrier. After all, these were their elevator operators, and they'd been pushing buttons since the beginning of time. Then it was a holy war. Now it seems pretty absurd. 
Needless to say, if you go to the Capitol today, those elevator operators are still pushing those buttons, and I suspect they'll be around for a lot longer than any of us will be here. Of course, you stand for election every two years in the House, so as soon as you arrive, there is instant pressure to hone in on the economic and political interests of your district. And that's what landed me on the House Agriculture Committee. It's probably why I'm in the job that I am today. And there I lived wheat and cattle policy for years. I also became chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, where I got to know Joe Nye, which gave me a glimpse of world-oriented politics. I'll never forget the night when then CIA director Jim Woolsey tracked me down at a Chinese restaurant in Washington to tell me that the CIA had arrested the biggest spy of modern times, Aldrich Ames. It was pouring rain outside. We were standing in a vestibule of this tiny restaurant on Pennsylvania Avenue, stopping our conversation every time somebody walked in to go to eat. And you know, it struck me. There was no partisanship at that moment, only concern for the country. And it's, an, it's a moment that I will never forget as long as I live. In Congress, I enjoyed having time to come in on a Saturday morning, sit in the middle of a huge pile of mail. I used to open all my own mail on Saturday mornings, much to the chagrin of the people who worked for me. But it was a good way to stay grounded and a good way for me to get a real sense of what people had on their minds. The president selected me as a secretary of agriculture, probably as much for my ties to Congress, and I'm a fairly nonpartisan type of fellow, rather than for my knowledge of agriculture, because a lot of people knew a lot more about it than I did. But a few eyebrows went up when I cast my last vote during a lame duck session of Congress in 1994 against the GATT agreement, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Now, uh, I was joining a pro-trade administration. I wasn't yet picked for the job, but at that moment, I was still the congressman for the 4th District. I had promised the people back home during the election that I would vote no on this because the vote was taking place during a lame duck session of Congress, and I thought it was too important of a vote to come up during that time period. And you know, I still had this feeling that I had to keep my promise, even though they had booted me out of office. And I remember uh, when I went to see the president, when he talked to me a little bit about this job, I said, Mr. President, I made this commitment. I'm going to have to keep the commitment. And he said, keep your commitment. Do what you have to do. And uh, so I, I, I think, however, my point in all of this is, is that it, it's a different view from the cabinet. Your perspective is national, but you're working within the confines of legislation and a budget that are decided by Congress. So there is parochialism, but it's of a different sort. President Clinton's views obviously have a lot to do with my decisions. I also have to contend with powerful members of Congress who control the purse strings of my agency and my budget. And it can do all sorts of ominous things, let me tell you, when they don't like some path that you're going down. It's an interesting contrast from the Capitol Hill where you, you're one of many and you can pretty much say and do in, as you please. In the cabinet, there's less personal freedom but much more power. So we have members of Congress moored to the interests of their districts and a cabinet generally focused on the national good and carrying out the president's policy. It's perfectly reasonable to ask, how does anything ever get done in this kind of scenario? And I'd answer much of our, as our founding fathers did. De Tocqueville once asked Hamilton, what is so great about America? And the classic answer, which is very famous, here, sir, Hamilton answered, the people govern. I would add, when they choose to. Somewhere between the cynic's view of a special interest-driven Gomorrah and the optimist's democratic utopia lies the reality of American governments today. I'd like to briefly discuss four policy debates in my agency that illuminates both the pitfalls and potential of governing and the conflict between the Congress and, and the executive branch. Let me start with food safety. Food safety is a great example. Throughout history, with few exceptions, the public interest in safer food was subsumed by certain interests, some in agribusiness, which tend to hold great sway over the congressional committees that make our food safety laws. For nearly a century, these interests have at times resisted major reforms despite our growing understanding of what causes foodborne illness. Take our meat and poultry inspections. Ever since Upton Clinton Sinclair wrote the book The Jungle, which started the progressive movement in America, Inspectors have stood on production lines looking for contamination as carcasses whiz by. Problem is, we've known for years that the most dangerous threats in our food are invisible to the naked eye. 
Last month, we started in this country a massive new revolutionary inspection program that tests for these hidden pathogens. What made this breakthrough possible? It wasn't just sudden meeting of the minds between Capitol Hill and the executive branch or industry and consumer groups. It was basically a logjam that came from the people. In 1993, thousands of people were sickened and four children died eating fast food hamburgers contaminated with the virulent strand of a, of a pathogen called E. coli. Suddenly, a sobering statistic, as many as 9,000 Americans die from foodborne illnesses every year, and that has a human face, and we saw it with those young kids who died. A tidal wave of public interest tips the political scales. Uniting industry, and I have to give them credit today for stepping up to the plate, consumer groups, government, and public health officials behind a food safety revolution. Next year, President Clinton has proposed that America spend $100 million more on food safety than it's ever spent in the past, doing cutting edge research, expanding a high tech early warning system to quickly control outbreaks, having a consumer education campaign. And you know these new inspections I'm talking about, well, industry now uses them in its advertising because safe food sells. Food safety is one area where people want strong government. It's the same with airplane safety. I flew up here on a 737, and I'm not going to just trust the airline to inspect those engines. I like the independence of an FAA that's there looking out after me. The same way it's food safety, bank solvency, national security, and the environment. People look to government to protect them in areas where they cannot protect themselves and in areas where they can't rely on the, exclusively on the private sector. So since the 1992 tragedy, an active, engaged public has very much been in the driver's seat on food safety policy, but not always. If you're like most Americans, you're probably shocked to learn that I cannot order a recall of unsafe food in this country. The Consumer Product Safety Commission can recall unsafe toys and cars and lamps and even fine the makers for negligence, but I can't take that action. The only thing I can do is shut down and close down a plant. And that's basically it. And I would tell you that I'd like to have these additional powers. And I'll let you draw your own conclusions why I don't yet have them. I'll just say that it's not the average person on the street saying, don't let government protect you from unsafe food. I'll give you a classic example. One of my predecessors, James Wilson, was Secretary of Agriculture for 13 years. And when Upton Sinclair's book came out, he wrote a letter to the Postmaster General of the United States saying, I have just read a book by one Upton Sinclair called The Jungle, a scurrilous and defamatory attack on the meat and poultry system in America. I urge you to use your powers to remove this book from the mails of the United States. Now, it is clearly not that level today, but it is kind of the classic conflict between a lot of the private interests which certainly dominate in this country and are important, but certainly are significant in the political process on Capitol Hill and the ability to make national policy. And in the food safety area, I think we've had some success, but it's taken tragedy to do that. Let me go to a very parochial issue, the issue of dairy, which a lot of folks in this part of the country have been interested in. Part of the genius of our political system is the protections it gives to minority interests. Depending on a minority's commitment, majority does not always rule. Take dairy policy. This is the penultimate stereotype of a Byzantine, incomprehensible to the average person federal program. Sparing you the details, I'll just explain that for decades, the government has set milk prices around the country based not on some highly sophisticated economic model, but how far you live from a town called Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Years ago, that region, produced most of America's milk. The thinking went, if we increase prices by distance from Eau Claire, the market will make sure that consumers in non-dairy producing areas have a regular supply of milk, and we succeeded. Dairy production today is much more regionally diverse, but we are left with a rather peculiar system in this country. So the Congress ordered me to come up with a modernization of this kind of system. And I, I proposed one, but I must tell you that it is really based upon where in the country you live that determines whether I am a fool or I am a hero. 
And when I was a member of Congress, my decision on dairy policy was exclusively based upon what it would do to the dairy farmers in my district. In this job, I have the responsibility to try to provide a modern government with a generally market-oriented system, because that's the era that we're in, is not the era of micromanagement from Uncle Sam telling the government what to do every time a farmer or anybody else turns around, but at the same time recognizing the interests of dairy farmers and all over the country and the interests of consumers who need a reliable, affordable supply of milk. So I updated that formula. And what's happened is that debate is devolving back into regional politics. And I understand the pressure behind that. It was relatively easy for me to come up with a national policy, which would have been virtually impossible for Congress to do. But ironically, the ultimate solution may be for the regions of this country to pull back and decide these issues on their own because they're so difficult to decide on, on a national basis. I only mention dairy policy because historically agriculture has been very regionalized based upon what, what part of the country you live in. Let me quickly talk about forestry because the Forest Service is the biggest part of our national budget. There are few more compelling examples than forestry policy, which pits two powerful interests against each other, the timber industry with allies who are extraordinarily well placed in Congress versus the environmental movement, which wields a different but even more intense sort of power. For decades, it was the local sawmill versus the nation's pristine jewels, with the timber folks usually winning out since they had the support of the previous two administrations. Then President Clinton came in and introduced a third option, which is sustainable economy, sustainable environment. We help timber communities diversify their economic base to include tourism and recreation, which today earn far more from forests than chopping down trees. There are still big confrontations, and we still need to do what I call common sense uh, harvesting of timber in this country. But I think we are moving towards a common sense consensus when it's with a sustainable foundation to what we're doing. And just in case there are any cynics out there, I should point out that this debate shows that elections matter. Who makes national decisions matter? Forest policy is perhaps the, one of the more classic cases. This administration has cut timber sales on public lands to one third of what they were in 1992. I say on public lands. The timber folks aren't thrilled with that. Neither are the environmentalists. Some of them would like to have no cut on public lands, which tells me that since nobody's particularly absolutely happy with what we're doing, we're probably right on the mark. Americans enjoy a strong economy and our great open natural places. We do not have to sacrifice either one. Coming from Kansas, where I think we have four trees in our own state natural, although we've planted a lot in recent years, this was a very hard issue for me. But it probably was good that I had no ax to grind in this particular issue, in the sense that I wasn't pushing, uh, let's say, the environmental agenda or the timber agenda as I was dealing with this particular problem. But it's been a very, very difficult problem to deal with, probably the most difficult problem that I have to deal with in this job. Finally, let me talk for a moment about trade. And I know that Secretary Daley was here. When we look ahead and speculate on what great tests our democratic system may face in the years, again, years ahead, trade poses one of the most fascinating dilemmas because it has the potential to pit not just various interests against one another, but the very natures of Congress and the cabinet. For most of this century, our international relations were framed largely around the wars, and that defined whole generations of our world views. Faced with an outside enemy, it was easy to forge consensus. Parochial and national interests were often one and the same. This is no longer the case in a world increasingly defined by global economic issues and trade. It would be easy for me to stand here at Harvard and talk about the importance of expanding trade to our economy, to global stability, to America's place in a new world. But let's look at this from a congressional perspective. With few exceptions, it comes down to how those congressmen's people fare. If it's grain farmers in the Plains areas, or dairy farmers in the upper Midwest or and Northeast, avocado growers in California, orange growers in Florida, car manufacturers in Detroit, or a whole litany of other uh, economic interests, the issue often comes down, I face this myself, is do they face more competition or more opportunity? And it's usually a short term. H.L. Mencken once said the only difference between the short term and the long term is in the long term, we're all dead. 
And when you're running every two years, you don't tend to think of the long term. But that calculation will always dominate the equation. On a macroeconomic level, the free traders generally win this debate. It's a simple fact of life. If you don't grow, you die. Here in the U US, we have stable incomes and population growth. Our biggest economic opportunities lie overseas. In fact, agriculture is the largest export item of the United States of America. Without increases in our sales abroad, this strong US economy will sputter, which I think is the basis of, of this president's economic policies. But why does this argument have so much trouble connecting with people in the country? And the reason for that is we often talk in academic terms about trade and globalization. And we fail to sell people on the connection between their job, their quality of life, their future, and their world. It's the ultimate irony that America is a spectacular success in the global economy, yet we have difficulty convincing our own people of its importance. Part of the problem is, is that the hurt is far more easily exploited than a help. A lost job is felt much more intensely than the gain of several hundred jobs. It's the old issue of man bites dog rather than dog bites man. One of the great challenges facing future Democratic leaders will be selling people on far more sophisticated, high-stakes decisions. Sitting on a national perch in the cabinet, it's easy to see the world of opportunity that's out there for this country. But until the American people can also see and feel what we are looking at, we will have a hard time addressing this issue. And we must also address the hurt that people feel in this process. And we also have to fight for fair trade as well as free and open trade as well. Let me just close and say this. I may be a little presumptuous, but in 21 years in politics, running 10 elections and now being in this job, I think I've learned a couple of things about what makes politics successful and those of us in here successful, things I know that Mickey Edwards knows as well. And some of them are simple and they're trite, but I think they're important. The first one is almost every successful person in American politics over the long term does believe in the golden rule, does treat other people with respect, fairness, decency, and honesty. Otherwise, you cannot have an intellectual debate. You will tend to get killed on the little things. Hubert Humphrey addressed the House when I was a freshman, he was dying of uh, bladder cancer at the time. And he, I'll never forget it, in a weak voice he said, fight every battle like it was the most important battle in the world. But when you are done, shake hands with your enemy because he may be your friend tomorrow on the next battle. We don't do that very much anymore. We tend to want to destroy our enemy in the political system today rather than make him or her our friend. And that is, I think this golden rule is uh, something that's critical. Number two, I find that you've got to keep the lines of communication open and never surprise people. Folks don't like to be caught off guard. They take it personally when you surprise them. It affects their dignity, and they react strongly, and they react in a hostile fashion. It's true in interpersonal relationships, but let me tell you, it's true in the American political system. You don't have to be afraid if you give somebody bad news, but when they hear it from somebody else that you've deceived them, you are in deep trouble. And the third thing is don't try to please everyone. You will fail. The things that are rooted in principle are the things that endure in politics. And while we all make our, our arrangements and we all have to do what we need to do periodically to get along, the, the concept of principle is important. And finally, I, I think that we never underestimate the importance of humor. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is it's important what we do, but, but I see too many people in this business taking themselves too seriously, taking their jobs too seriously. And I don't think that we need to do that. Uh, you know, no matter who we are, it's useful to remember that the world will move ahead notwithstanding our absence. So let me just close by saying that I consider myself one of the luckiest people alive to have had the opportunity to serve on a local school board in the United States Congress and in the cabinet of the, of the President of the United States. And, and um, on the, uh, over of the Speaker's chair in Congress, there is a quote by Daniel Webster in which he talks about that all of us in life, regardless of what profession we're in, have the obligation to do what we can to do something worthy to be remembered. And hopefully I and my colleagues in the Congress and in the cabinet will be able to do that. Thank you all very much.
Very good. That ranged from the philosophical to the very practical and a great introduction to government for students at a school of government. We now will hear from some of them. Uh, and uh, we have two microphones here on the floor. We'll alternate between them. And uh, we'll start on this one. Good evening, Secretary Gl uh, Glickman. Um, my name is Mark Sam, a first year over the college. Being from Los Angeles, a big issue that we talk about is the environment in which the grape uh, pickers are working. Uh, we just had a vote up at the college and it was passed that we're still gonna be serving them in the dining halls. I'm curious, how do you view the, uh, the farm owners and the uh, environment in which they're, they're causing the many illegal aliens, including children, a large percentage are children under the age of 16, to work in these, uh, killing them with the pesticides in the god-awful uh, situation? Well, first place, uh, uh, Secretary Herman, the Department of Labor, and I are going to try to do a kind of joint tour in the country to physically look at farm labor conditions in Florida and Texas and California next month or in April. Uh, traditionally, that has not been an item within the jurisdiction of the Department of Agriculture because we don't really regulate farm labor issues. It is true that uh, particularly in, in uh, fresh fruit and vegetable country, there has been a tendency to rely on immigrant labor. Some of it is, uh, is uh, you know, American citizen labor, but a great m majority of it has, has been people coming in as, as guest workers or other, in other kinds of roles to pick the crops. and. Uh, Clearly, uh, there has not been a stellar record in terms of their protection and working conditions, housing, uh, and environmental conditions. Uh, some agricultural uh, uh, companies do a better job than others. But I do believe that uh, one of the things I can do, coming from the Department of Agriculture, is become more engaged in these issues. They're complicated. And you know, H.L. Mencken also said, for every complicated problem, there is a simple and a wrong solution. So I'm not going to tell you that I have an easy answer to this particular problem, uh, because uh, particularly with fresh fruits and vegetal, vegetables, seasonable workers have historically been used, as opposed to in my part of the country, where they grow wheat or corn, they don't need seasonal workers to do it. But I, I do believe that we have a special obligation in terms of living conditions, uh, wages, and uh, health and safety protections, and housing to do a much better job than we've done in the past. Yes. Hello, Secretary. Yes. Um, my name is Michael Passanti, and I'm a junior at the college. Um, I'm also an economics concentrator, and as you can imagine, the professors in my department aren't terribly fond of the agricultural subsidies that um, the U.S. government provides. Um, it's sort of almost standard economic theory that it's, um, you know, it's sort of using taxpayer dollars to cause inefficiency of sorts. And um, I, I tend to agree with them, but I probably come from a somewhat uh, biased perspective coming from New Jersey, ironically called the Garden State. <laughs> and uh, my question for you is, uh, do you agree with that, and why or why not? Well, you know, there are a lot of things in American life that are inefficient. We have a giant defense budget to protect this country in the event that we go to war, and we use it hopefully never, but it's there. And uh, we have it there as an insurance policy. So not everything in American society is absolutely based upon pure economic principles. Now, saying that, I want to tell you that we are moving in this country towards more market-oriented agriculture. In 1996, the Congress passed and the President signed a bill to wean farmers, wheat farmers, corn farmers, cotton farmers, from direct subsidies. And those will basically scale down significantly by the first part of the next century. And under the theory that the government should not be in the business of micromanaging every part of agriculture. That is already true in livestock. Livestock is half of American agriculture. Cows, pigs, and chickens are basically commodities not regulated by the government, and they don't get a check from Uncle Sam. Now, saying that, there are some commodities that I must tell you it's harder to do that on because of history. Dairy, uh, tobacco, and we can talk a little bit about the tobacco program. Uh, peanuts, these programs have much longer rooted histories than some of the other programs that occurred as a result of the uh, Roosevelt's New Deal program. Third of all, you've got to remember a little bit of the history. The heart of the Depression occurred in rural America. It's when the soil was blowing away and millions of people went broke farming and left. 
And Roosevelt believed that there had to be a way to sustain those people on the land in order to keep them producing food and fiber. And from that grew our, our farm programs. They really hadn't been modernized dramatically uh, for a long time, and Congress has started that effort, and I, I support that effort. Finally, let me mention one other thing to you. Out of a $1 trillion budget, we're going to spend $6 billion on farm programs. Use your math. It's a pretty tiny percentage. And while it may not make perfect economic sense from your professors, uh, for the most part, I presume that you have enough food every day, and most people in this country do as well. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Jeannie Lang, and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, pardon my sweatsuit. Um, but um, I guess also pardon my ignorance, because the question that I'm going to ask is we see so much of what the major interest groups are vying for. Um, we see this in the daily newspapers, the AARP and whatnot, and we don't see much about agricultural issues. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what the major issues on the plate of the, um, uh, on the political agenda of the farmers are right now. What are they dealing with? Trade is the biggest issue because we sell uh, about 60 percent of what we produce at home. And with the Congress and the new legislation that basically weans farmers from direct subsidies in most areas, the insurance policy for farmers is the ability to have access to markets around the world. And um, uh, one out of every two and a half bushels of wheat sold are sold or need to be grown or sold overseas. And so that's why things like uh, liberalized trade, the, the providing funding for the International Monetary Agreement, those issues are life or death for farmers. The, their, their ability to survive is to a large extent build, uh, ba uh, based upon their ability to sell their products around the world. So as a general concept, that's the highest topical short-term issue now. Now, I've been lucky. Since I've been secretary, farm prices have generally been pretty good. Interest rates have been the lowest sustained interest rates for a very long period of time. Agriculture is the most interest rate sensitive part of the United States economy, given the massive amount of leveraging and borrowing that takes place. So I haven't quite had the immediacy of some of the traditional commodity problems that a lot of other people have. Now, another two, number two issue, conservation and environment are big issues. Ag the Agriculture Department runs the largest environmental program in government. It's called the Conservation Reserve Program. Uh, we basically uh, are uh, setting aside, so to speak, nearly 30 million acres of land to prevent it from blowing away and washing away. It's, it's, it's a, basically a land uh, erosion prevention scheme that, and I say scheme in the best sense of the word, in order to keep uh, highly erodible land from blowing away, it also has wildlife and water quality related events to it. Uh, the third issue in agriculture has to do with concentration. More and more you see uh, meatpacking companies, railroads, owned by fewer and fewer people. And, and one of our jobs is there, not so much to, to fight that trend directly, because there's a limited amount that I can do to stop those trends. But what I can do is provide tools for small farmers to, to be able to expand, to get into value-added agriculture, like making something out of their crop, uh, farmers' markets, organic agriculture, those kinds of things. So that's kind of the, the big thing, so to speak, on my plate right now. Finally, I'll tell you one other thing that's on my plate. Never did I think that civil rights would be a dominant issue in the Department of Agriculture. It is the most explosive issue I face right now. Really? Uh, it has been something that's been going on for a long period of time. You know, before the Depression, near, nearly half of African Americans lived, actually 70 percent of them lived in rural America, largely in the South. The massive migration to major cities took place frankly, in the 20s, 30s, and, and then shortly after the Second World War. A lot of the way you, the, our programs are run are based upon historically less than democratic institutions in rural America, and that has tended to hurt a lot of minority farmers who have gone out of business at a faster rate than non-minority farmers, and we've been very engaged on that issue as well. I'm sorry, what sort of institutions? The, the institutions are like, uh, uh, they have to do with the way our offices ran farm programs around the country. Okay? Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Kristen Winkle, and I'm a student at the Kennedy School. And you made a reference to the FAA, which is an agency that has, uh, is beholden to both the airline industry and also to um, airline passengers. And I, as I see the 
USDA, it seems to be an agency that has similar conflicting interests of being both beholden to the food industry and also to consumers. And I'm wondering, how do you balance those That's two? a very good question. I wouldn't necessarily use the word beholden, although some would, because I like to think that we'd become more arm's length. When I shut down the Hudson Beef Company, I didn't look like I was beholden to the meatpacking industry. But it used to be that the people who were involved in food safety were also involved in promoting meat and poultry. And in 94, Congress split the functions. So our food safety people no longer do anything but food safety. But there's no question that, as you can see from my speech, part of my goal is to promote agriculture, you know, and hope that farmers make a living and, you know, see that part of American economy strong. But at the same time, uh, I'm the guy that people see on the street corner and ask how hot should they cook their hamburger or their turkey because they believe that I'm the food safety person as well. It's a conflict. It's less of a conflict, I think, than there used to be. And one of the reasons why is gradually industry understands, I go back to this thing, that safe food sells. And if they, if they offer rotten products, they will be out of business, particularly in this modern information world. So they're, 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 they're they're coming into the fold of understanding that effective arm's length enforcement of food safety laws is necessary for them as well. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Amanda Proctor. I'm a junior at the college. And as far as I know, I'm the only person to ever come here straight from Goddard, Kansas. <laughs> and I just wanted to say that, that was my old congressional district. Yeah. <laughs> and I just wanted to say that um, I'm very dismayed about this new growth of Kansas politicians who were elected on a singular issue, such as gun control or abortion, despite their inexperience, despite their outsider You're status. You're talking about my opponent, the guy who beat me. I'm talking about many, many different yeah. people yeah. who, who uh, won for office recently. But I was just wondering if you had given any consideration to coming back to Kansas for a congressional race or Senate race. No, no. Uh -huh. And the way I look at politics is, is uh, first of all, I have a very wonderful job, and it's a job I would have given up my house seat to take. So I'm, 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 you know, I, I owe great honor to the, the country for having this job, and I, I thank the president for having the confidence to pick me for this job. In terms of my own election, I was beaten by somebody that, quite honestly, I did not believe had the experience or the background that I did. There was a little arrogance there too. I'd been in a long period of time, and and uh, you know, I, I, I philosophically, however, I. I didn't agree with him, but you know, the voters do that. <laughs> you know, they taught me a lesson. What can I say? You know, it wasn't the end of the world. The country goes on. The public doesn't like extremism. It doesn't. Uh, the the public is very fair-minded, and when people start, when the politicians start pushing people too much to one end, people rebel. And as long as we keep a lot of the freedoms that we basically have, the, this short-term phenomenon will, will not last forever. And I can tell you that, uh, that those members of Congress are quickly learning that the ideological agenda is no ticket to long-term seniority in the Congress. Good evening, Mr. Secretary. Yes, um, my name is Alexandra Langla. I'm a student here, and I'm an agricultural engineer. And uh, could you tell us a bit about the future of the American food aid uh, in terms of what countries will be targeted and what types of aids? Well, unfortunately, America's role in providing food assistance has not been going up. It's been coming down. Um, and, uh, you know, we still provide some assistance. Uh, most of that's done through the PL 480 programs. Um, and. Uh, uh, I, I would like to see us more engaged in food assistance. Uh, you see this whole situation in Asia is, uh, while these are developing countries, uh, shows you how fragile a lot of these countries are in food production. The great need right now is in Southern Africa, uh, where uh, food assistance, both direct food aid as well as, well as technical assistance, we do, we do quite a bit of this with the, the uh, uh, private volunteer organizations. Uh, but a lot of this has been picked up by Europe and Japan, and I do not want to see America being left behind as, as, as a helper in the world. The President has asked for significant increased funding of the Peace Corps, which I think is very important in providing that kind of uh, assistance in the world. One other thing, we must have an active, engaged research budget. We can produce crops that use less water, 
less pesticides, less soil, both contamination as well as uh, draining nutrients uh, from the earth, and, and, and increased yields as well. I mean, the technical capabilities of having an active, aggressive research budget are probably the greatest, will be the greatest long-term contributors to food insecurity. We basically provided the tools for India to become self-sufficient agriculture in the 1960s, and that was the Green Revolution. Now we're undergoing the biotechnology revolution, which is somewhat controversial, uh, but I think we can't resist progress in that area. Yes. Hello, my name is Christina Davis. I'm a graduate student in the government department. Um, my question relates to a comment you made in your speech that we must fight for fair trade, mm -hmm. which makes sense given this is the largest export of the United States. My question is, what do you see as the best tactic for doing that, and whether the achievement of the Uruguay Round and the establishment of the WTO means that hereafter agriculture trade can be pursued through the GATT multilateral process, or if you think we should be using Super 301 and a lot of negotiations? Well, pr it's a good question. Probably all of the above. Uh, we're going to have another, gr another round of the Uruguay round coming up. In fact, I'm going to Europe uh, in March to meet with my uh, colleagues from some of the major Japan, Australia, Canada, uh, the European Union, and others to talk about this issue. But I think we should continue this effort to reduce tariffs uh, uh, and, and reduce state trading enterprises and other impediments to trade, notwithstanding what we, I mean, they, they ought to be a big part of our WTO and our GATT, next GATT round agreements, but we also are going to have to pursue them bilaterally as well. The biggest threat to trade and agriculture, however, the short term, is the use of sanitary and phytosanitary measures to keep our products out uh, and, and using science, which is not necessarily good, sound, substantial science as a way to keep products out. Now, I must tell you, having been Secretary of Agriculture, on occasion, American agriculture producers do the same thing. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenon of, of, of trying to pursue your own economic interests, but th this is a very big threat. I face this right now with the issue of biotechnology. We're on the verge of being able to produce uh, various uh, seeds that do not require hardly any pesticides. Um, that's good. Uh, there's great reluctance to move into this new scientific arena for a lot of fears, some justified, some not justified. And I think that that's the greatest threat we face in agriculture right now, as well as high tariffs in some parts of the world. That's where the IMF does a lot of good. It, like, for example, in Indonesia, we, IMF was able to get their tariffs down significantly, so they were able to buy more wheat from us. Yes. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for coming this evening and speaking to us. I am one of the two farmers in the room tonight, and although, all, although I am just one, there's 6,000 farmers in Massachusetts preserving yes, 600,000 acres of our fine state in open space. Uh, and your, your former Ag Commissioner is my Undersecretary for Farm and Foreign Agriculture Services, his yes. name is Gus Schumacher. Yes, I was at a meeting with him last, uh, last yes. week dealing with uh, the small farm package, right. I think. Uh, the question I have is the, the Food Quality Protection Act and how it relates to integrated pest management. Yes. Uh, I sit on the, the state's IPM executive committee, and Massachusetts is the first state in the union to have a certified IPM program. And this is done in conjunction with the USDA, the Farm Service Agency, uh, UMass Extension, and also the state's Department of Food and Agriculture. And we take pride in bringing to our population a product that is greatly reduced the amount of <coughs> materials we place on it to grow this. But with the Food Protection Quality Act, we're concerned that a lot of these materials may be, may be removed, and it will make it more and more difficult to use these IPM technologies. And also, it may give some of the foreign uh, produce uh, an economic advantage in the marketplace. Uh, mass I mean, the, this is the biggest surplus is the uh, agriculture in the country. And that might diminish if the uh, Food Quality Protection Act is enforced as written. I'm concerned about this as well. Our Deputy Secretary today met with uh, people of EPA to try to make sure that there are some clear standards in this area so that producers uh, know what the rules are and so that products can't be jerked off the market, uh, particularly without having the Department of Agriculture having input into this process. So. All I can tell you is, is that I am also concerned about this issue. Yes. Hello, Secretary Glickman. 
I'm a plant protection and quarantine officer, and I work for the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. That's part of the Department of Agriculture, <laughs> for those of you here. <laughs> and our mission is as the first line of defense for keeping foreign insects and diseases out of the United States. And recently, our budget has been downsized with even more cuts expected in the future, even though there are millions of dollars in a user fee account, which has been collected from passengers and conveyances entering the United States. The downsized budget is having a negative impact on both our present and future ability to keep pests out of this country. And my question is, do you believe it is better to spend a relatively small amount of money for prevention right now, rather than a large amount of money to cure any outbreaks which may occur due to decreased diligence at ports of entry due to budget cuts, even though plenty of money has already been collected but is unavailable for use? Well, my answer, of course, is yes. Uh, <laughs> And, but I, I, would, I would say that, uh, and that uh, protecting America's borders from pests is obviously one of the key roles the department has. We've got bu budget problems. Former budget director is over here, but he can't help me out anymore. Uh, and uh, I just have to, I have to deal with the resources that I have and what Congress gives us in the appropriations process. But it's a very high priority to make sure that we don't have outbreaks of the kinds of pests you talk about. For example, the whole issue of BSC and mad cow disease, okay? The United States has not had one case of this. Part of it is because we stopped a lot of the imports that would have got, gotten us into trouble about a decade ago. You know, that is both for the American consumers as well as for the American livestock industry. There are lots of other related issues that affect plants and animals all over the country. And I recognize there are fees collected, but under our budget process, you know, most of those fees go into the general operating fund. Um, and uh, I'm actually proposing a lot of fees to fund our meat inspection again, which I didn't get great approval from yet, but maybe I will. So um, I appreciate uh, your advocacy for this, and I'll keep, uh, keep doing what I can. Thank you. Yes, last question. Uh, Mr. Secretary, my name is Ayers Hall. I'm a private citizen. Um, in 1990, Congress passed the uh, Organic Food Production Act, yes. and your agency, together with a number of others in Washington, has been working very hard since then, and has recently, uh, December 15th, put out your regulation to enforce that, and it's now two-thirds of the way through the period for public comment. Um, earlier in your speech, you mentioned a market-driven economy, and I was wondering, given that organic foods are more expensive than uh, conventionally grown crops, and given that there is such a small percent of the market, um, why couldn't the regulation be changed so that it uh, follows both the letter and the spirit of all of the recommendations of the National Organic Standards Board instead of appearing to diminish and make the organic label be much, much closer to conventional farming, which is... Right. Well, let me first tell you, I have extended the comment period for 45 days. So you should know that uh, we have until May the 1st, <coughs> I believe it is. I'm going to take that as official. That's been going around, and I... Yeah, no, no, it's official. Okay. Uh, second of all is, is that we've gotten thousands of comments. And uh, third of all is, is that uh, without prejudging this, because we're in the regulatory process, I, I think it's not likely that I will approve rules, finally, that the organic industry will find offensive. Now, say that being that, I, I don't want to prejudge all the substantive issues. We, we left a lot of issues open for comment that a lot of folks wished we had not done. But you've got to remember, in my job, again, I've got to serve the entire public interest, not just what the organic community wants. So I've got to make sure that I get comment on a lot of issues that I didn't think were fully resolved in the process to date. So, so that, that's, but I haven't prejudged these issues either. In my statement extending the rules, I said we have not approved organics for irradiation. We have not approved uh, uh, genetically modified organisms. And that impression is out there. All, I, all we did is we didn't dispose of those issues. And uh, we've allowed additional time for people to, you know, to come in and talk about them. And then at that point in time, we will take that comment and revise the proposal. And uh, so, that, so I just, from a question of good faith, however, I, I believe that organic agriculture has a, has a, a substantial place in the, gr the growing uh, uh, of pro crops. It's particularly suitable uh, for small and medium-sized agriculture. It offers them an opportunity that some of the larger agriculture doesn't have, and I want to see it flourish. And so we'll, we, we're going to make sure that, that the rule is consistent with that.
Thank you very much. Okay. We, we often have wide-ranging speeches in the forum, but I think when you go from Hamilton into Tocqueville to biotechnology, that is pretty close to the record. I want to say that you both enlightened and entertained us. You've uh, done a terrific job for this school of government, and we'd love to have you back. Please join me in thanking Secretary Glickman now. Oh, it's just a, yeah, it's just a, yeah. I think we did it. I think we did it. Oh, that's good. Very well done. Dick Teeth? Dick has now joined our faculty.